In this video, I'll be discussing the basics of options. I'll walk you through how options are priced and talk about put call parity. And then finally, I'll wrap up with some of the more common option trading strategies. So what is an option? Well, as the name implies, an option gives an investor the option to trade some underlying asset. It gives the holder the right, but not the obligation to buy or sell a given quantity of an asset on or perhaps before a given date at a price agreed upon today. Options are a special type of asset called a derivative. Derivatives are assets whose value is derived from the value of another security. You've undoubtedly heard of other options in your daily life, like futures and forwards. Since the value of an option is based on a stock or other asset, it also qualifies as a derivative. Options like other derivatives, play an important role in the global economy by allowing investors to hedge against the risk of an asset. They also allow less risk-averse investors to act as speculators and buy or sell options in order to profit on the change in the value of the option. Options are traded across many different exchanges, including the Chicago Board Options Exchange, or SIBO. The trading of options, like that of other assets, is overseen and regulated by the SEC. Now, if you want to buy an option, you'll have to pay a price. That price is called the option premium, or just premium. The seller of the option receives this cash immediately, but they're still party to the option contract. Selling an options contract is also known as writing an options contract. If you pay a premium to buy an option, that allows you to buy shares of an underlying security. The seller of the option has to sell you their shares if you exercise that option. This means that they need to either have cash on hand or own the underlying shares in the event that you exercise your options. Also, keep in mind that the only reason to exercise an option is if it benefits you. If there's no benefit to you to exercise the option by the expiration date as the buyer of the option, you won't exercise it. If this happens, we say that the option expires. As we'll see in a little bit, Put and call options, the two primary types of options, trade in the open market, much like stocks. There can be hundreds of different options written on a single asset. Now let's talk about call options. A call option is an option that gives its holder the right to buy an asset at a strike price. The strike price is set when the option is created. If you buy a call option and you want to exercise it, the strike price is the price that you pay to buy the underlying asset you'll always have an expiration date on any option as well. If you haven't exercised the option by the expiration date, the option becomes worthless. So why would you want to exercise a call option? Well, put simply, as an investor, you want to exercise the option to buy the underlying asset if the market value of the asset is greater than the strike price set by the option contract. The reason for this is that you get to pay a price for the underlying asset that's below market value. If you want to resell that asset at market value immediately, you can, and you'll immediately receive a positive payoff. The profit you make on a call option is determined by this simple formula. Profit equals the market price of the underlying asset, or S, minus the strike price, often referred to as K, minus the costs associated with the option. These costs include the premium, and also currently include any trading fees that you pay to your broker. The bid-ask spread is also often thought of as a trading fee, although it's an implicit one. The spread for options can often be very wide, especially for options that are not widely traded. Call options are one of many popular ways that managers of a firm are compensated. You can probably see why. If the firm does well and the share price rises, the manager can exercise their call options and buy shares of company stock at below market value. Call options incentivize CEOs and other managers to do what they can to increase the share price. Now recently, call option popularity has somewhat diminished as a managerial incentivization tool, partly due to the fact that other incentivization tools have been created, like the issuance of restricted stock, which are shares of stock that employees can sell only if they're still an employee of the firm. Now, before I go any further, I think I should add a side note. Most of what you're going to see in this video is from the perspective of the buyer of the option. When someone buys an option, they're said to take the long position on that option. If they sell the option, they're said to take the short position. Now, I'll mention the short position again near the end of this video. 
To illustrate how call options pay off, let's take a look at this chart. In this chart, we've got the price of the underlying stock on the x-axis and the profit on the call option on the y-axis. When you buy a call option, you're going to pay a premium. And in this case, your premium is going to be $500 total. So in this case, you bought a certain number of options for a certain premium per option, and the price you paid total was $500. You immediately lose that. Now, if the price of the underlying asset rises, let's say the stock price rises to, oh, $60. Well, even though you had to pay the premium, your profit is positive because when you exercise this call option, you're exercising it for $50, which is our exercise or strike price, and you get to buy shares of $60 stock for $50. So your, your payoff here is going to be $10 and your profit is going to be $10 per share minus whatever your premium was per share. The other type of option we need to discuss is a put option. A put option is an option that gives its holder the right to sell an underlying asset at a set strike price on or before the expiration date. This option is purchased by investors that want to ensure they'll be able to sell some underlying asset at no less than a specific price. As such, it's one of our best hedges against downside risk. If you're an investor who purchased a put option that gives you the right to sell an asset at a strike price, your payoff for exercising the option is positive if the market value of the underlying asset is below the strike price. Let's take a look at how you profit from a put trade. The profit on a put is calculated as the strike price minus the underlying stock or asset price minus the cost of the option. Again, the cost of the option includes the premium, any brokerage fees, and the implicit cost of the spread. You profit from the use of put options when the underlying asset value falls significantly below the strike price. Just like a call option, as soon as you buy a put option, you pay a premium. So that premium is illustrated right here. And again, our exercise or strike price is $50. But in this case, if the price of the underlying stock decreases, your profit increases because you get to sell shares of this underlying stock for $50. And if that stock, it, let's say the stock price falls to $20 a share, you're selling shares of $20 stock for $50. So your payoff here is going to be $30 per share. Your profit is going to be that $30 per share minus any premium that you paid. All right, so let's take a look at an example. And we're going to calculate the profit of a call option. So in August of 2018, you believe that the price of a share of Apple stock would rise. You purchased a call option on Apple stock with an exercise price of 102 per share and an expiration date of 12-16-2018. Apple shares were trading at $100 and the option cost $225. Should you exercise the call option right now? Now, keep in mind, you only ever want to exercise the call option if there's a positive payoff. In other words, you only want to exercise it if the share price, the underlying price per share, is greater than the exercise price. Well, in this case, your strike price or exercise price is 102 per share. The underlying stock price, currently 100. Your option cost is 225. And here's your profit formula. And so in this case, your profit here is going to be 100 minus 102 minus 225 for the premium. In this case, you have a profit if you choose to exercise this option of negative $4.25. So in this case, you wouldn't want to exercise this call option. Rather, you would just let it expire and then you've lost the value of your premium. So if you let it expire, you've lost 225 instead of 425. So in this case, don't exercise the option. Now, suppose the share price of the Apple stock rises from $100 per share to 110 on the expiration date. Well, in that case, your payoff is going to be, again, just your stock price minus your exercise price. So in this case, your payoff is going to be $8. And your profit is going to be 110 minus 102 minus 225. And I forgot to put the premium, uh, minus the premium in here. So your profit here is going to be 575. So in this case, it makes sense to exercise the option. 
So in this case, you would just exercise the option and your profit is 575 per share that you've exercised your option on. Now, let's assume that instead of buying a call option, you purchase a put option with an exercise price of $102 per share. Uh, the put option here is going to be 25 cents and the share price has fallen to $90 a share. Let's calculate your payoff and profit. So your put option payoff is just, again, your exercise or strike price minus the stock price. So 102 minus 90, so $12. And your profit on the put option is just your strike price minus your stock price minus the premium, or 102 minus 90 minus 0.25. So in this case, your put option profit is just going to be 1175 because, well, the share price has fallen and you get to sell shares of Apple stock that are currently trading for $90 for $102. So in this case, you would absolutely want to exercise the put option. Now that we know how to calculate the payoff and profit from an option, let's define three phrases we often hear with respect to that payoff. First, we have in the money options. In the money means that if you exercise the option, you would receive a positive payoff. If the strike price on a call option is less than the current price of the underlying asset, we say that the option is in the money. This means that if you exercise the option, you'll receive a positive payoff. Likewise, if you've purchased put options on an asset and the strike price of those puts is greater than the market price of the underlying asset, your payoff will be positive and your put options are in the money. Out of the money options are options that, if exercised, will lead to a loss. If you own call options with a strike price above the current asset price, exercising those options will lead to a negative payoff for you, so you would never exercise those out of the money call options. At the same time, any puts that you own whose underlying asset price is above the strike price, those puts would be out of the money, since if you exercise those puts, you would sell the underlying assets at less than the market price. Finally, we have at the money options. And at the money options, well, at the money means that the strike price and the, the underlying asset price are equal. There's no difference in payoff between exercising and not exercising the options. Not all options are the same. Some options allow you to exercise them at any day until expiration, while others only allow you to exercise on the maturity date. The former are called American options, and the latter are called European options. American options are the most common options for stocks. If you want to buy a stock option, you can exercise the, that option at any point until it matures, usually on the third Friday of a month. European options are commonly used for currency and indexes. Note here that the names American and European have nothing to do with geographic region. Now, let's take a look at options in the real world. Okay, so I'm on Yahoo Finance, and let's take a look at options for Apple. So, for Apple, if you want to look up options on Yahoo Finance, if you go over to the Options tab, you can find all of the options that are currently trading for Apple. So we have a huge number of options on Apple stock, and a large number of them have different strike prices. So here are all the possible strike prices for options on Apple stock. Each of these options that you see has different characteristics. And we can look at the bid and ask prices for each of these options. Right now, Apple stock is currently trading for $241.41. And we, we can see the actual premium or the, the price per option. That's going to be reflected in the last price or the, the asking price is the current premium that you would have to pay to be able to buy this option. At the same time, if you scroll down here, we'll see the put options. So up above where the call options, up below down here are the put options. And they're sorted by the strike price. So lowest strike price to highest strike price. And these ones in blue, this means that the strike price is above the current share price. And we can also see the one-day change in the value of the options. Notice here that there are some huge changes in 
the value of the option. So this is why we say that options are more risky than stocks. You can see massive one day returns if you're trading options. And we'll talk about how you actually calculate the value of an option in a few moments. You can find options on a large number of assets. You've just seen an example of stock options. However, you can also have options on stock index funds or ETFs, futures contracts, foreign currency, and interest rates. With currency and interest rate options, you're buying and selling the option with some expected exchange rate or interest rate in mind. The strike price would be the exchange rate between the dollar and some foreign currency, or the interest rate. So now that you know the basics of options, let's go over why they're used. The most common use of options, like call options and put options, is as a risk management tool. You can reduce your exposure to changes in the price of a commodity by using both of these options. You can hedge against a decline in the value of some assets, and options also allow you to offset any large decline in the value of your portfolio. So let's take a look at how this is done. In this example, I've got a stock and a put that I can invest in. I invest in 100 shares of the stock and 100 put options on those shares. In scenario A, the price of the stock rises from $25 to $50. So I earn a profit of $25 per share times 100 shares minus the $1.50 per share that I paid for each of the 100 puts that have a strike price of $25. Total, I had a profit of $2,350 compared to the $2,500 profit I would have if I only bought the stock and not the puts. Now in scenario B, we can see the protective benefit of the puts. In this scenario, the share price of the stock falls to $10 from its starting price of $25. This means that we lose $15 per share times 100 shares of the stock, or $1,500. The puts we bought have a payoff each of the strike price minus the stock price, or $25 minus $15 times the 100 puts. Therefore, the payoff of the puts is $1,500. The cost of the puts is still $150 total. However, the payoff from the puts completely offsets the loss from the stock in scenario B, and our only loss in this scenario is the price of the puts, or $150. In this scenario, we would have lost $1,500 if we didn't have puts on the stock in this portfolio. So the takeaway here is that puts act as a great hedge against downside risk. As I mentioned earlier, you can purchase options on almost any asset. Because of this, there's infinitely many ways that you can use options as a risk management tool. For example, in the airline industry, one of the most expensive inputs is jet fuel. If the price of oil, and therefore jet fuel, increases, the profit margin of airlines like Delta and American Airlines will shrink. However, if these airlines purchase call options on barrels of oil, as the price of oil rises, they profit. This profit helps offset the loss from the increased price of jet fuel. Another example of puts being used in risk management comes from the agricultural industry. If a farmer only produces corn, a decline in the price of corn could lead him to lose money at harvest time. If he were to purchase put options on bushels of corn, the strike price on those options would be the price he would sell those bushels of corn for. A future decline in the price of corn wouldn't matter that much to him because regardless of the market price of corn per bushel, he still locked in the price he can receive when he sells that corn. Now let's talk about how we price options. If we're pricing European options, this is the formula we use. It's called the Black-Scholes Option Pricing Model. As a bit of background, this formula was developed in an academic paper by Fisher Black and Myron Scholes in 1973. It earned both Myron Scholes and Robert Merton, who performed some follow-up work on the model, the Nobel Prize in 1997. In essence, this formula says that the price of a call option, or C, for a stock S that matures at time T is equal to all of this. If we want to use this formula in the real world, and I promise we do, we need to know the value of five inputs. The stock price S, indicated right here, the strike price K, 
the risk-free rate R, the time to maturity T minus T, and the implied volatility of the stock, which is indicated by sigma. And the implied variance is sigma squared. With these five inputs, we should be able to calculate the intrinsic value of a European stock option. Let's take a look at this model and see if we can price some options with it. In our Excel spreadsheet, I've put an option pricer. We'll walk through it and we'll see how accurately stocks are priced. All right, so I'm over here in our Excel spreadsheet and we have our pricer. So like I said, we have five inputs that are used to calculate the value of a European call option. So all we need to do is identify each of these inputs. Now, first things first, we need to know the share price of the underlying stock. So let's say it's currently $241.41. The exercise price of those options, let's say that it is, I'll scroll up here, let's say that it is $240. number of years to exercise. So let's say that that is one month, or in other words, one twelfth of a year. So in this case, it would just be one divided by 12. Next, we need a risk-free rate. And the risk-free rate that we're going to use, I'll, I'll use the one-year T-bill. And the current one-year T-bill rate is 15 basis points and the standard deviation. This is our implied volatility. And the issue with this is this number we can't directly calculate. So what I'm trying to get at here is we can calculate historical volatility. Sure. I mean, it's just the standard deviation of the returns on whatever stock we're looking at. In this case, it's Apple. However, this volatility number that we need to put in here, this is going to be the expected future volatility of this stock, the underlying stock, over the investment period. In other words, over this next month. And quite frankly, there's no way to know that. People will put in whatever they expect to be the volatility of this underlying stock over the next month. Now, what I'll do is... I'll look at the implied volatility, which is in this last column on Yahoo Finance. And in this case, the implied volatility of Apple stock, or this the option on Apple stock is 68.87. And I'll make sure that this is for, well, we'll say May 8th. It's about a month away. So now it's 56.99. And down here, these are just calculation cells. They're just calculating the, they're just calculating this formula. And then down here, we have the value of our call option. This would be what you see right here. C, uh, parentheses, S, comma, T, close parentheses. So this is the value of a European call option on Apple stock. Now, if we compare it to the current price of the American call options on Apple stock, you can see it's pretty close. I mean, $17.13 versus $16.51. There are a couple of big difference here, differences here. Uh, obviously, European versus American call options. So the American call option th that you see on, the Amer on Yahoo Finance, this allows investors who purchase this option to exercise it at any point before the maturity date, whereas the European call, call options don't. Also, we're not looking at purely a month here. I mean, the date right now is April 5th, and our maturity date for this option is May 8th, so it's a little over a month, so that would explain why it's a, a little pricier, or the last trading price was $17.13. Now, notice here that our calculator also gave us the corresponding value of a put with the same strike price. Now, the reason for this is because we have something called the put-call parity equation, which I'll discuss a little later. So, quite frankly, 
if we know all five of these variables, we should be able to value a European call option and a European put option on this stock. All right, now that you've seen how European call options are priced, it's time to talk about some of the relationships between the variables and the option price, or the premium, in other words. So the most obvious relationship is going to be the time to maturity. The longer the time to maturity, the longer the time that the stock that underlies this option has to increase in value. So there's a positive relationship between time to maturity and the premium, or rather the value of the call option. Also, there's a positive relationship between the stock price and the call option value. And this is fairly obvious because as the, the value of the stock that underlies the asset goes up, I mean, that's, that's our primary driver or one of our primary drivers of the profit formula. If the strike price goes up, however, that's, I mean, we're subtracting the strike price from the stock price to get our payoff. And so that, that would decrease the value of our call option. Asset volatility, if that increases, in other words, if sigma increases, as the implied volatility of the underlying asset increases, the value of the option increases. This is because you don't have to exercise the option if it's out of the money, but the values when the option is in the money will now be more dispersed and further away from the mean. In other words, more positive. Finally, an increase in the risk-free rate increases the value of the call option. For put options, an increase in the time to maturity also increases the value of the option. As a side note, the loss in value from a decrease in time to maturity is called theta decay. As the stock price increases, the value of the put option decreases. This is because the payoff of a put option is the strike price minus the stock price. Intuitively, an increase in the strike price will increase the value of the put option. Also, like the call option, an increase in the implied volatility of the underlying asset leads to an increase in the value of the put option. Finally, an increase in the risk-free rate will decrease the value of the, the option. Now that you know how to price European call options, let's talk about that formula that I just recently mentioned, the put call parity formula. This formula says that the price of any stock, S, should be equal to the value of a call option with strike price K, minus the value of a put option with strike price K, plus the present value of a bond with face value K. Notice that the present value of a bond with face value K is simply K divided by one plus the risk-free rate to the power of T, where T is the time to maturity in years. What this formula says is that the value of the stock on the left, on the left-hand side, should always be equal to the value of the three assets on the right that together form what's called a synthetic stock. The negative sign on the put indicates that we're taking the short position. This means that we're selling the put rather than buying it. When you sell a put, your profit is the exact opposite as if you were buying it and taking the long position. Now this formula allows us to determine if there's any arbitrage opportunities available. If the two sides of this equation don't equal each other and the trading costs are low, we can make an arbitrage profit, in other words, a profit without any risk. Now let's take a look at an example and illustrate this. All right, so you know the current price of stock is $115 a share. You also know the call and put prices of the stock with a strike price of $105 per share are $17 and $5 respectively. The risk-free rate is 5%. Use the put-call parity relationship to determine whether there is an arbitrage opportunity. Now remember, there's an arbitrage opportunity if the two sides of the put-call parity formula are not equal to one another. So in other words, if we find that the combination of the call, the put, and the bond are different from $115 per share, there might be an arbitrage opportunity. So here are our inputs. We know the stock price, S. We know the call price, $17 per share. We know the put price. For, this, for the strike of 105 is $5. We know the risk-free rate of 5%. And now we can use this put-call parity formula. So all we're doing is just plugging, chugging, and notice here that our risk-free rate of 
we usually just want to use the the one year risk free rate. And so what we get is that our call price minus our put price minus the face value of the bond at 105 divided by one plus our risk free rate for one year is equal to $112 per share. Now, since this $112 that we just calculated is less than $115 per share, there is potentially an arbitrage opportunity here. Uh, so we're assuming that there there's no trading costs. If the trading costs were $3 or let's say very, very large, uh, there really wouldn't be an arbitrage opportunity here. But in this case, let's say there's no arbitrage, there's no trading costs. So the way you would make money on this is you would short the stock, which is overpriced, and then you would also take the long position on the call option and the bond and the short position on the put. So these three, a year from now, should equal this, this, this left-hand side. So eventually these two things will be equal. So if you're taking the, if you're shorting uh, this, this $115 per share stock, and you're taking the long position on the right-hand side, eventually those two will equal, and now the short position pays off and the long position on the right pays off. Now, let's talk about how options trade in the real world. Options are traded very similarly to stocks. Options on certain stocks and other assets are even traded on multiple exchanges like the SIBO, the NYMEX, and the EUREX. When you buy options, Typically, you're purchasing options on 100 shares of stock, also known as a round lot. Several brokers like E-Trade will allow you to only buy options or allow you to buy op options on as few as 10 shares of stock. Individual traders will often trade options with the intention of profiting on their speculation. Speculative investors who are not trying to use options as a risk management tool will often sell their option long position on options whose premiums have increased in value and profit from this rather than exercise their option. Let's take a look at this in the real world. Okay, so I'm back on Yahoo Finance and I'm looking at Apple. So. Again, I'll go down to their call options and this $240 strike option that expires on May 8th of 2020. So if I had bought this call option, let's say a week and a half ago for, let's say $10 per, per option contract, I could sell it right now for something very close to, well, something in the... 17 or $16 range. I mean, if I wanted to sell it right now, I would have to sell it for $16.55 because that's the current highest bid price. So essentially what I'm trying to get at here is you can profit on option trading by not necessarily exercising the, the option, but rather buying it and then selling it at a later date for a profit. Now, if you own options and you don't own the underlying asset, what you own are technically naked options. So for example, if I bought puts on Tesla stock right now, but I didn't own any shares of Tesla, I would be said to own naked puts on Tesla. If you do own the underlying asset, you're said to own covered puts or covered calls, I guess you can also have. So speaking of covered puts, I think it's time to show you a few common trading strategies starting with covered calls. Since these calls are covered, you already own the underlying asset, in this case, the, the stock. In this trading strategy, you have a long position on the underlying asset and a short position on the call option, meaning that you've sold call options on the stock that you own. The blue line represents your profit on the call position. The red line indicates your pay, your profit from the stock. The green line indicates your total profit as the price of the underlying stock increases. Notice here that since you took the short position on the option, you sold it. You receive the premium up front, which is about $4, so just whatever this here right right here is. However, if the stock price rises above the strike price of $21 per share, your payoff on the call option will begin to decrease. And this is because the option is now in the money for the investor who bought your call option. 
In other words, they can exercise it and you have to sell your shares of stock, which might be priced at, let's say, $33 per share for $21 per share. Now, this strategy is common for someone who wants to increase their profit, but who doesn't expect the price of the stock to increase beyond the strike price. The next option trading strategy you should know about is the straddle. What you're looking at right now is called a long straddle, where an investor buys calls and puts with the same exercise price and maturity date. The strike price is again $21, and the profit structure of the call option is in blue, while the profit structure of the put is in peach. The total profit from this strategy is in green. Notice that with this strategy, any large movement in the underlying asset's price, either positive or negative, results in profit for you. If the stock price increases above $27 or decreases below $16 per share, you profit from the strategy. You can also use a strategy called a short straddle where you sell both calls and puts. The profit from that strategy is the exact opposite of what you see here. In other words, the profit, the line in green would be something like this if you follow my cursor. Next, we have option spreads. An option spread is a combination of two or more calls or two or more puts on the same stock with differing exercise prices or times to maturity. In this strategy, there are defined maximum and minimum amounts that you can gain or lose. What you're looking at is called a bull call spread. In this strategy, you purchase a call option in red with the strike price at $17 per share, and you sell a call option, which is in green, with a strike price of $21 a share. Your profit structure is in blue. Notice that the maximum you can lose is bounded at $1. This is because for low stock prices, you get the premium from the call option with the higher strike price, but you lose the premium on the call option with the lower strike price. Using a combination of options, you can create any payoff structure you want. You can create trading strategies that include more than two option contracts, like the iron condor or the reverse iron condor. So the iron condor looks something like this. Regardless of the payoff structure, however, you still have trading costs that are positive. So now let's review the more important points of what I just covered. First, options give both investors and firms the ability to speculate and manage risk. We also saw that we can calculate the price or premium of a European call option and therefore the price of a European put option if we know the strike price stock price, risk-free rate, time to maturity, and we have an implied volatility number that we're thinking of. Next, we saw that return volatility of options is much greater than that of their underlying assets. In other words, you can earn very high returns, but you can also have very, very negative returns. Option trading is extremely risky. Finally, we saw that option trading strategies can be profitable if an investor's expectations are proven correct. All right, so with that, I'm going to wrap up, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or call me or ask to set up a uh, Zoom interview if you prefer, and I suppose I will see you on the next video. Thank you.